Good evening. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's View of Business. Now, I love positivity, as you know, and today I have an absolute legend. Let me just run through his achievements. I'll go on Wikipedia because I think they give the best description. An American chess master, chess administrator, chess, to chess tournament organiser, chess book publisher. Not just a chess book publisher, but a number one best-selling chess book publisher. He has titles in the game. He has dealt with everybody in chess. But now he has his own foundation that is giving so much back. And personally, I met the, the guy through a, another media channel. And he's an absolutely top guy. And he is down to earth. And he just loves passing on what he knows to others so they benefit. Good evening, Mr. Jim Eid. How are you, sir? I'm doing excessively, exceptionally well. And I, I do thank you for having me on, Ben, because you, you and I became friends uh, over the internet and uh, through, through meetings like this, because physically we can't go anywhere now. And so this is how we do it. And it, it's not as good as face to face. I wish I could meet you with you over lunch, but, uh, or tea, but um, I, uh, you know, I don't, I don't take for granted the way that we could communicate now. It's wonderful. So, Mr. Reed, sir, the legend that is, tell us about the world of chess and how you got into it and what it means to you. Yes, um, well, thank you very much um, for that opportunity because, you know, besides myself, chess is the main topic I'd like to talk about. Um, and <laughs> I got into it uh, as a teenager. Um, Bobby Fischer took the world by storm uh, when he defeated... Uh, Boris Spassky for the World Chess Championship. And of course, there was a Soviet dominance of the, of the world of chess for, for decades. And uh, Fisher was like this lone American hero of mine and many others who um, faced that uh, Soviet system and defeated it. And so it was just one of those stories. He was on the covers of magazines. He was on the front page of the New York Times. And so I just started to play chess. And at the same time, I was, suffered a, a knee injury that was incapacitating. And all I could do was kind of sit down and play over chess games. You know, my dad brought home a chess book for me and I was, uh, this whole world opened up. It was like, I could discover all these games from the past, all these players from the past. And, that, and the books that I was reading made them come alive to me. And so what turned out to be like an interesting thing and following it in the news um, and I watched <clears throat> the actual championship match on television. It was on a TV show. And so I couldn't believe it because uh, chess was not a, very popular in the United States. And, and, you know, I knew how to play the moves, but now all of a sudden I was just absorbed by it. I was fascinated by it. And, you know, you go through all these uh, teenage angst years and chess was my primary escape and a primary because I got good at it. And it's self-reinforcing. You become good at something, you keep doing it. And um, so then, then adults started to take notice. And uh, I couldn't, you know, I, I was better than anybody in the high school. I was actually the top rated high school player in all of New England. And uh, so there's, you know, all, all those states, uh, I was the highest rated. So I was uh, taken to the local college chess club and I became as good as anybody there. And it was very hard for me to find competition. But these adults that were actual tournament players would take me as a teenager to these tournaments in, in what were far away locations like Boston, New York. And uh, they, they would, um, I would meet players that were not only as good as I was, but were better. And I was kind of starstruck because I thought for a while there, I was the next Bobby Fischer because everybody I played, I was, I was beating. And um, if they could beat me, I played them until I could beat them. And so, you know, there weren't, there weren't that much in the way of competition for me. But when I went to New York City, I got my comeuppance. It was like guys my age were as good or if not, they were, some of them were better. And I couldn't believe it. Maybe I wasn't the next Bobby Fisher, but it made so much difference in my life in those teenage angst years to have adults around. You know, I never knew either of my grandfathers but um, there were men of their age that were taking me under their wing and kind of giving me guidance, you know, and, and uh, not just about chess, but about life. So, 
I learned a lot of life lessons through chess. And I'd like to come back to that because I do think that the pandemic has perhaps brought the average age of a chess player down, but we'll come back to that later on, Jim. What I really want to know at the moment is, it's obviously shaped you as a person. Tell everybody what chess has brought to you as a person because knowing you the person and dealing with you outside of the chess game, I know that you're a very caring, very passionate person. You do something, you do it well. But it's that care element as well in that. Tell us how chess has shaped that for you. Well, one of the things that you do is you face an opponent over the board. And, and the Russian word for it is partner. And that that is actually what is a better word for what my experience was, because you're creating a game together. You can't do it by yourself. You have to have someone playing with you. And if you create a beautiful game, you can't take credit for that. You're sharing that with a partner. And so my experience was, and you would play somebody um, in a tournament game, whatever the result, you know, there's a break between the next game. So you go out to lunch. So I made a friend every tournament. And that was my expectation. And, um, you know, so I, I thought, you know, and it's not a social event. It's not like bridge where you can play and talk. You, you're silent the whole time. But it's funny how you actually can communicate a great deal, even without saying words. And, uh, you know, the tension of the game goes here and then it increases and then it, then it resolves itself. And then you're just human beings again, you go out and talk. And so for me, it was the competition was the main thing, you know, it's testing myself. And uh, did I pass or fail in this particular game? But also you found people that actually shared a, their passion that was your passion. And you made friends that were lifelong friends. And so th this is this is what um, helped shape me as a person. So, and you, they're still friends today, I guess, Jim, because I know you got yeah. self and they keep in touch. Yeah, they're still friends yeah. today. Like uh, on Facebook, I moved 3,000 miles away from them, but on Facebook, they're still my friends, you know, so I, I still chat with them. Uh, and, and of course, you live in San Francisco, don't you? Um, yeah, just south of it, yes. And of course, being in the States, the obvious massive question this week that should be answered, Jim, as it's a big week, is are the 49ers good enough to get the Super Bowl this year? <laughs> uh, they had a massive rash of injuries on their defense, so I think not. <laughs> but they had a good win last week against the Patriots, of course, Jim. Yeah, was, yes. Well, you know, I, I, even though I grew up in New England, I grew up in, uh, I was born in New Haven, Connecticut. So New Haven, Connecticut is like, an, is, the, is really New York City extended. You know, they call it the tri-state area for a reason. If you're in North Jersey, Southern Connecticut, you're part of New York. And so we all rooted for the Giants. And so uh, uh, we hate the Patriots. <laughs> but then I went to school with everybody who was massive Patriot fans. You know, everything was Boston, Boston, Boston. And I'm like, New York, New York, New York. So I was <laughs> always a little bit out of step. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, Jim. So and, and it brings us to an interesting point, though. Where is chess in comparison to the national game? Well, chess has gone through an amazing change. Um, and that, actually there's a Netflix movie or series out now called The Queen's Gambit. And I read the book when it first came out. It was a wonderful book. Um, and it's very popular. It's become incredibly popular it, by people who don't play chess. I got a call from a woman I know. She was driving back from LA and she said her mother and her just binge watched the whole episode. And she wanted, cause she knew I was a competitive chess player. She wanted to know what I thought of it. And this is like, ne this never would have happened when I was growing up playing chess. People get scholarships on their ability to play chess to go to college, to university. This is like a dream of mine I might've had once, but I never thought it would be a reality. You could get, you could get your room and board paid for by playing chess. Where was that when I was applying to college? You know, so um. Uh, it, and also the scholastics level, the chess in the schools has become a, an enormous phenomenon. It, it took off in the 90s. I used to go up to a principal of, of the school and say, I'll do a chess program here for free. And they would look at me like, why would I want that? And then five years later, they were calling me, please, please, please. And there wasn't enough of me to go around. But now all of a sudden, there's enough people that play chess that can teach chess and chess programs in schools is now normal. 
it's not strange. You are a big driver of that, Jim, with your foundation. That, that, that's not underplay that, and obviously that is forward. How much? How much? What do you think the pandemic is? What do you think the pandemic has changed in chess? Well, what has, has seriously changed, and this is this is really an interesting time, and it's almost a Chinese uh, curse that we live in interesting times. But the positive, the little ray of sunshine that's coming through the clouds, is that the chess world has moved online. And the benefits of that are, you know, I cannot express them well enough because now you can be playing someone even though you're, they're in a different country, they speak a different language because the language of chess is universal. If you know how to play chess, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're speaking, the language you're speaking, you're playing chess. So the rules of chess are universal. Everybody understands them, no matter if I don't understand what word you say, I understand the moves you play. So it works out. And it's amazing that now kids today growing up, they have access to games. They can watch games live that I used to have to wait three months to read about. So um, it's a tremendous change for the younger players growing up. They have so much more information and they have so much more experience, playing experience against, play. like I used to have to drive hours to find somebody to play against that was strong enough to play me when I was in high school. Now they just log on and they can <laughs> play anybody anywhere, you know, that's willing to play them now, at any time. That brings us to a very pertinent point. There's a great place to start with chess. There's a little known book only brought by millions and millions of people called Chess for Dummies. Now, this, yes. isn't, this isn't the only book you've done, Jim, but I think it's your most popular. I know you're going to hold up a copy because you've always got one on your desk for me. I, I do. I do. <laughs> this one, I, I'm going to hold up a different one. This, time. <laughs> this one, let's see if I can get this. This is Chess, chess. Openings for Dummies. I've written five books on chess. Chess for, for Dummies is the one that's the massive bestseller. And that is the smartest thing I've ever done in chess. Uh, but Chess Openings for Dummy was the follow-up. They asked me to write a second book. And um, that's how popular the first one was. Now, the second one, you're not going to find it at your bookstore. <laughs> 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 well, when, when I edit this, Jim, I won't put the cover up of Chess Opening for Dummies. I'll put the Chess for Dummies cover up then, if that's all that's known. <laughs> <laughs> it was the start of you giving back to the game, wasn't it, really? So tell us, tell us why you wrote it and tell us what you wanted to achieve with the book itself. Thank you very much for that opportunity because um, people want to know the sales numbers. And although that, that is comforting to think of that, how many people have bought the book, why did I write it? And what was my target audience? Because when you sit down and you write something, you're either writing from your heart or you're writing something specific for a specific purpose. And I fell in love with the publisher. They were IDG books at the time that since been sold multiple times to different publishers, um, much to my gratification because each one has had more distribution muscle. But the IDG people were doing something different. They were using, and they started out with just computers. And I bought Microsoft Word for dummy because the Microsoft Word manual was worthless. Uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't find anything that you needed to know uh, for me. And, um, when they came out with Microsoft Word for Dummies, everything I wanted to know, and I was publishing at the time, so I needed a lot to know a lot, and um, I could find it right away. And the idea behind it was to demystify something that people thought was too complicated to learn. And they broke, broke out, I read about them breaking out a trade press, what they called a trade press, which was going to be something beyond computers. And I thought, holy smokes, chess would be perfect. You know, I would be teaching grade school kids and the parents would come to pick them up and I would ask them if they play chess and they go, oh no, uh, too, you know, chess is too complicated for me. I'm teaching your eight-year-old. It's not too complicated. It's not that complicated to learn. Someone just has to take the time to teach you. And then for me and for many, many others, it opened up an ocean of chess literature. And what it teaches kids is to sit still and think primarily, which is directly transferable back into the classroom. 
it teaches them to postpone immediate gratification. The first thing people do when they learn chess is they want to move their queen. The queen is the most powerful piece. So move the queen. Well, you learn very quickly. If you put your queen out there, it gets captured. <laughs> you don't lose your queen. So you have to move other pieces out first and bring your queen out later when it's protected. Yeah. So yeah. postpone immediate gratification is a life lesson. So there's many of these life lessons, but my audience was not those kids. Who's going to pick up a book and study chess? Well, I did, but I'm, you know, I'm the exception that proves the rule. It's the parents. What if their kid starts showing chess talent? The parent doesn't know anything about chess. Oh, there's a book, Chess for Dummies. Oh, well, I'm the dummy. I'll buy it. So I don't think the kids are buying the book. I think the parents of the kids that have talent are the buying kids. the book. The kids are probably probably getting off the internet and teaching the parents. The parents having to go and buy your book, Jim. I think it's worth saying. It's probably and, it's, pro it's probably a bestseller now. It sold really well when it first came out. It's probably even more, even more popular now within the adult industry. So, uh, yeah, definitely. And and it's a renewable resource because there's always kids getting good at chess, and there's always parents that don't know anything about it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Jim. All, I I say this right in the beginning. Just learn to talk a good game. So when your kid says, you know. Uh, you know, I, I, I won his queen. You know what they're talking about. Yeah. You know, and then you can have a conversation with your child about chess. And this is the thing that I wanted to do was make chess demystified so that it could become more popular. Because the average uh, attention span of the average American is not very great. So they don't take the time to learn a great many things that they think will take time to learn. And if you can get them to learn these things, it opens up vast opportunities for people. And this is true of children. And then they think, hey, if I can play chess, I, what's this algebra thing? Algebra can't be that hard. Yeah. So it gives them confidence. And I love to see that. Now, it wasn't your first book, that's fair to say. Uh, it, I think it was about your third or fourth book you wrote, Jim. The third. Uh, third book. When you, so you obviously had written books before, but when you were writing this one, did it feel different to the first two? And did you know what you were really opening up for the world? Yes, the, thir the third book was intentional. My intention was to popularize and demystify. The, the, the first two were about me. <laughs> <laughs> That's your second favorite subject now, though, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> The first one was about an opening that I specialized in and I had discovered moves and no one else had played and, and I wanted to tell the world about me. And the, the, the second one was about a tournament that I organized. It was a grandmaster tournament of a specific category. It was very strong. It had the women's world champion in it. It had uh, Josh Waitzkin, who the movie uh, Searching for Bobby Fischer was based on. Uh, it had uh, Maurice Ashley, who was the first African-American grandmaster. It had uh, it was won by Victor Korchnoi, who was a refusenik, a famous refusenik, and Boris Golko was playing in it. And he was another refusenik, who, who Soviets that had to escape the Soviet Union and uh, and go to the West. And um, <clears throat> of course, when the Soviet Union fell, that changed chess too, because all of these players who weren't recognized in in the in the West came out and started beating everybody. <laughs> they were unknowns to us, you know. Probably a guy driving a bus in Moscow could beat me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but they, well, they, they got under the scale because they, 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 when they were practicing, nobody knew what, what the moves they were doing. So the moves, of course, were, were unique. Uh, and they, well, we, we could subscribe to the Yugoslavia at the time. It's since broken up into multiple countries, but at the time Yugoslavia could um, talk to the, the Soviets and also to the West. So, um, the Soviet games came through Yugoslavia to us, but there's yeah. that long delay. Now you just log on and see what's going on. But uh, it's a different time. And of course, I think that the, really we fast forward to the present day and I know that you've set, now set up the Eid Foundation. Yes. Again, I'm gonna ask the same question. Why? Uh, yes. It's uh, a very noble thing to do, but. Tell us why and what, what, you're, you, what, you're, um, what you're trying to achieve with the foundation itself, Jim. Well, I was president for 10 years of the Uni United States uh, Chess Charitable Chess Trust. And this was the longest running uh, charity in chess. And what we did was we targeted schools 
like we call them, they, they had a specific term, the Title I schools. And these were schools that did not have a lot of money. And so if you wanted to chess, start a chess program there, they had no money to buy chess sets and equipment. So we would send it to them for free. We would send five chess sets to them so they could at least have the, the equipment to play. And now I thought uh, they need something to teach them. And so that was one of the things that I, you know, I had done chess for dummies. And so I could send it to a teacher who could learn to teach. And so this was all coming together for me, but the, we were getting requests from outside the United States and we had to say, no, we're the US Chess Trust. So this is a charity, but it's only for the United States. And I felt really, uh, it just demoralized me at some point when I was turning down these requests. And I thought, shouldn't there be a chess trust for the world? So I started the Eid Foundation and I do the same things, but I do it all that the trust did for the United States, but I do it all over the world. Started programs in U Uganda, Zambia, Nicaragua, and I was just getting started when COVID hit. And now these people that I was helping start programs, you know, they're looking to where's the next meal coming from, not where it's the next chess game. So the, the, until this pandemic eases, um, you know, I cannot do what I was setting out to do, but I was starting out doing exactly what I wanted to do with my life. And it only took me 60 years to figure that out. <laughs> oh dear but I, i'm gonna guess that you've not sat there though during the pandemic you've been planning things for the future for the foundation haven't you yes and that that's part of what um i've been trying to increase my internet presence which is um how to reach people because you know the e foundation has this service that it can provide but if no one knows about the e foundation what good does it do and if if people are we need my service and I don't know about them, what good does it do? So somehow I have to find out the people that want what I can do and have them find out that I can do what they want. So my ideas and what I've been spending my time doing on COVID is doing shows. You know, they, they were on another media uh, that we were both on. Um, now I've started my own channel. So I have another uh, YouTube channel that um, it's called the Eid Foundation because it always comes right back to me somehow. <laughs> I don't know, I thought, yeah, I didn't think of that name, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> it's the Eid Foundation. It's all about Eid. You know, <laughs> so I've got my name in, on, the, on the title cover, on the cover of all my books. I've got my name on the foundation. You know, it always comes back to me. <laughs> but I, I know we've had a bit of a laugh there, but of course, Jim, that is important. It's consistency. You know, you can't put anything else on a book other than your name that you've wrote. You know, you, you can't do that. So, so the fact that it is your name, the fact that you are achieving so much for the chess industry. Where do you see the, the industry as a whole now with, with regards to chess and where do you see it over the next five years? What, you know, because obviously people are sat at home a lot at home. Do you, do you think we're going to go back to the chess board or do you think we're going to carry on with the, the internet side of things? It's a terrific question, and it's one that the chess world is is uh, scratching their head about right now. And I have my um, own view on it, and it's not shared across the board. So it's very, it's a, a perspective that will not be um, popular. And but my perspective is is I grew up on the over the board competition, face to face, and so this internet chess play really doesn't appeal to me. Playing chess on online. It just, um, well, there's two reasons. One is, is that it's just not the same. It's just, it's a little bit like uh, talking to you over Zoom instead of having lunch with you in person. It, it is something different. It's not, you know, necessarily better, or worse, or it's different. And so it's not what I'm accustomed to, so it doesn't really appeal to me. And um, it can be too addictive too. Once you start playing, when do you stop playing? This is hard for me. It was like, okay, when my wife came home one day and she said, you know, how was your day? What'd you do? Oh my God, I played a thousand games of chess. That's all I did. You know, so I quit cold turkey. I don't play anymore online, but unless I'm giving an exhibition, unless I'm doing a demonstration, unless I'm teaching. Uh, but I don't 
play for me anymore online. It's a different experience. But kids growing up today, that's their normal. That's what they're used to. So that's the future. You don't have to appeal to me. You have to appeal to them. You know, so they're loving it. And like I said, they can log on at any time, play somebody who's what, what if there's their night person in, in uh, Siberia and you're a morning person in the United States, you can play. Yeah. You know, it's wonderful. And so what we have to do is uh, figure out what do we do about cheating? Because if you're com competing online, if you're competing for something like a prize yeah. or a title or just to say who's the best, who, how do you know you're playing James Eid? You might be playing Ben Coates. They'd know if they were playing me rather than you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, or you probably. might be signed up for an under, under 12 age uh, girls tournament and you might have a grizzled old guy like me playing the moves for them or telling them what to do. So there's cheating that's possible that's not possible over the board in face-to-face -face competitions. So there's a elaborate designs about how do we uh, avoid that. And um, some of them are, are good, some of them are not so good. And uh, the confidence has to be there that you're actually playing the person that you think you're playing. It's Once difficult. Once we work that out, I think that'll be okay if we ever work that out. I think the difficulty is that you don't want to discourage anybody playing chess that's the key to it that's what you've always clearly from today's conversation it's what you've always desired is more and more people playing chess yes but of course the other side of things is there's nothing like the touch the smell you know the atmosphere and yeah. also also the ability to go and have a point together after exactly that's you know when i go to an annual tournament uh, the u.s open for example uh, i go there it's like a high school reunion i see these guys i grew up with and so we play our games and then we adjourn to the bar. Yeah. And, and um, where have you learned where have you learned most things, though, Jim? In the bar. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, you know, you're not talking to anybody when you're playing chess. <laughs> it's after you stop playing that you start talking and yeah. you start learning. <laughs> of course you do. It's everything like that. You always, you, you know, when you're intense, you're in a game, it's man yeah. on man, woman on woman, man on woman. It's that competitiveness. You go in the bar, you go, wow, thanks very much. Let's have a drink together. And that's where the and conversations you blow, off steam. you blow off all that steam. Yeah. So yeah, it's, 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 it's why I would go now. It's not to compete because, you know, I used to score out of six games, you know, four and a half would be my normal expected score. Now when I go, it's four because, you know, I'm older. I, I just, I can't maintain the concentration for hours like I used to. So, uh, you know, I'm not there to try to win the tournament. I'm there to see my old buddies, the guys yeah. I used to hang around with, that I grew up playing with. And, you know, so it's a social experience now. And you don't think social could be a, a, a good experience, but it is. And people have this stereotype of two old men playing in the park. And, you know, fine, that's great. But it's a kid's game. You know, you cannot play at a competitive level. You cannot play it into your, nobody's a great player into their 50s, let alone their 60s. There can be a couple of exceptions, but they just prove the rule. You know, you've got to be in your 30s to really be good, you know, and people are getting great in their 20s now. So, you know, that, that's because they have more information and can play more and they're getting better younger. But then they still have that energy, that ability to concentrate for the extended periods of time. Hours you have to yeah. concentrate because one bad move will ruin 40 good moves. <laughs> and you just become the experience then, the, the old Ed, so to speak, that's just guiding people. Because all you want to yeah. do is get people to play and get people yeah. to enjoy the game, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And let them experience what it just did for me. Yeah, you know, maybe the they can't get along with their parents. But there can be somebody who's older running a tournament or, or somebody that's, that's uh, you know, older at the tournament playing in the same section as they are, and they become friends. And you have this experience of intergenerational experience. It's a, that's wonderful to have. And it's, of course, these foundations that you've got in your life, you're putting through the foundation itself, Jim, and that's only going to encourage 
more and more players to play, more and more players to actually enjoy the game, more and more players to... And of course, it's like anything, the more players we get, the better quality we get because you push each other. So, uh, full marks, you congratulations on everything you do achieve in the game itself. Um, and also the, the, what you, the philosophies you take through to your life, Jim, because you, I think you're an amazing person. I'll be honest, I've never been into chess in a big way. It's not big in the UK, uh, but the yeah. past few weeks and months of, of us meeting and conversations that we've had has made me take a different look at the game and, and, and realise the importance of it, what it is to the world. And I think it is now more important than it ever has been because... Like you say, and I understand what you're saying about the touch of the field, but the fact is we are in an internet uh, period of the world. That's going to go on for the future. And players, people can now go and take an hour out of the day. And we do suggest time limiting it. Of course, it's like it's yeah. like a computer game, time limited. But go and have a game of chess and learn and start to learn. You've got to start somewhere. So what's your... Um, <clears throat> Where, where, what's, how can people get to, in touch with the foundation? How can they support the foundation, Jim? Where do they Thank go? You, to, and, uh, that's, <clears throat> I would have forgotten to, to mention this, but it's edfoundation.org. Org means it's a charitable uh, 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 company. And what we do is, uh, if you're in the United States, if you donate to the Eid Foundation to help us help others, um, you can write it off of your, your taxes. Uh, and any donations are welcome, of course, uh, but that's one of the things that you, you go through this tax status process, which is not a whole lot of fun, but you do it so that people can, um, you know, take, take it off their taxes when they donate to you. But uh, who knows about the tax system? That'll change next year. Um, <laughs> maybe, you know, so may, maybe it won't be, uh, that won't be a, a, a reason to do it. But the reason to do it is, is will remain forever which is to help others and to however you help them, you know, do what, whatever works for you. This works for me because I know chess and this is what I can do and I can help others. So help me help them. Jim, you're helping people with their mental health. You're helping people with their education. You're helping people learn and study and also take time out of their lives to relax because it can relax in the game. So from the UK, to the best American football team state in the world. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. You've been an absolute pleasure. You're a gold, you're a gold mine. Uh, and if you do want any information, just look Jim up. He will help you. He, he loves the game to bits. Uh, and thank you for being the, the positive entrepreneur that we really enjoy on this podcast. Thank you very much for joining us, folks. I really hope you enjoyed that. Jim, pleasure, sir. Thank you very much.